Let me welcome you to our worship service this morning. Those of you who are in person, those of you who are listening to us online, hope you had an outstanding Thanksgiving time, uh, whether that's by yourself, with family, with friends. But uh, thank you for joining us for worship today. And uh, as we come here uh, in person, we've had two different worship experiences that have brought us together for, uh, for this scripture time. But uh, many of you listening online might have your own praise music that you've listened to. So we welcome you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17, it says, The Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I hope and pray today that you are experiencing God's freedom. I hope that you're experiencing the joy of the Lord. If, uh, if you're here in person, let me ask you to do this. Before you leave today, share with someone how much you appreciate the opportunity to get to see them and to worship alongside with them. Tell them of a joy or a sadness or a prayer request that you might have. I think when we come to worship, those are the kind of things that, uh, that we share with one another. It has been my privilege to be with you for the past couple of weeks, and in fact, if I've not met you, let me introduce myself. My, my name is David Smith, and I serve as the executive director of the Austin Baptist Association. Uh, our association takes in just south of Round Rock, uh, north of Buta Kyle, kind of a fuzzy line there. Our westmost church is Henley, uh, out beyond Dripping Springs, and to the east is Bastrop. And in that area... Uh, there are almost 200 Southern Baptist churches, and uh, your church, this church, is a vital part of all of that, and so I bring you greetings from those, from those churches, and uh, it's been a treat to get to preach with you over the past, for you over the past couple of weeks. When I have an opportunity to preach more than one Sunday service, uh, it gives me an opportunity to, to go after some of those topics, some of those passages, some of those themes that are exceedingly near and dear my heart. And today, I want to talk to you about the value of reading God's Word. It was interesting this week as we were traveling to Dallas to spend time with family, and I, I asked Julie, I said, hey, why don't you help me a little bit, see what you can find online as to the value of reading Scripture. And man, there were all kinds of uh, referrals, references, all kinds of testimonials of the value of reading scripture. I hope today, if I were to call on any one of you in person or those of you online, that you could give me a nice answer. Listen, reading scripture, reading God's word, hiding God's word in my heart and in my life has made a significant difference because. Now at our home, and Bethany can attest to this, we love to make New Year's resolutions. We like to make them. I'm not so good at keeping them. Thank the Lord we are, not, uh, we are not judged on how many of those that we keep. But one of the ones that we make as a priority in our home is that we are going to read through the scriptures over the course of the year. Now this year, in anticipation of our what are our resolutions for next year, I, uh, I surprised Julie a little bit, and I said, hey, I just didn't do it once this year. I did it twice. And I'm not bragging because, really, the second version was kind of a new and interesting version for me. Not only did I read the Bible through this year, but I've also listened to the Bible. And if, uh, if you're here this morning, and you so, say, hey, I don't know that I could read it all the way through in a year, then fine. Then I'll give you a get-out-of-jail-free pass, and you can listen to it. Now, here's the amazing thing. You go on to uh, Bible Gateway or to a Bible reading app. You can get it in a man's voice, a woman's voice, a high voice, a low voice, a deep voice. You can even get a European English kind of version. So you can really get kind of any flavor or variety that, uh, that you would like. But what is the value of reading God's word? Well, when you read God's word, as it says in Isaiah 55, verses 10 to 11, here's what it says. It says, for just as the rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat, so my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. I want to share with you this morning that as we're going to, to look 
at God's word, to see the value of reading God's word, that there's nothing lost. There's absolutely nothing lost in spending time reading God's word. I tell people this. I said all throughout scripture, there are promises that God has for those of us who are his followers. And if you don't read them, you don't know them. And if you don't know them, you can't live in the victory, in the power of God's word. So here's what I'm going to do, because I'm going to make a pretty heavy commitment to you, those of you online and those of you in person. My email address is david at austinbaptist.org, D-A-V-I-D at A-U-S-T-I-N-B-A-P-T-I-S-T dot O-R-G. I was thinking about handing out this Bible reading guide, but I thought, you know what? I want to pray for each and every person that commits to doing this. Now, if all of you do, I'm going to have a very busy prayer life if I'm to cover all of you here today. So I would very seriously ask you to, to think about and pray about it. If you start and you don't make it, listen, not the, not the end of the world, but I'm telling you, doing it will, will bless you big. What I will do in return is I'm going to email back to you a Bible reading plan for the year. It was put out by Discipleship Journal a number of years back. And every day it gives you a little Old Testament reading and a little New Testament reading. And it breaks the month down into 25 readings so that if you find there's a day that you miss, you're not overwhelmed because every single day has to be completely filled. You can get ahead Or you can fall behind, but you can catch up. Now, here's what Julie and I have found has been very helpful. We find the brightest paper that we can find anywhere. And we copy it onto that, and we stick it in our Bible, and then we can tell one another, hey, have you seen my crazy pink piece of paper, or my orange, or my green, or whatever color that you choose? And if you choose white, it's fine. It's not the deal. It's just helpful to be able to see it. And you can tick off box by box the passage of scripture that you read through. Now you say, well, what if I just want to read it from beginning to end? Hey, come on, have at it. I'm just telling you when you get to Leviticus, it's a bit tough. There's a lot of stuff there that you're going to be reading and you're going to go, I don't know. But if you do, you can do that. And you might want to do this. You might want to go out and buy a read through the Bible in a year Bible. And that's pretty cool because then you have the actual Bible and you're reading through it over the course of the year and you could sign at the beginning uh, after you accomplish that, that, hey, in 2021, I accomplished this task. So real quickly, I just want to, I want to give you a couple of reasons as to why you should read God's word. Number one, I think is the best because Jesus says, how about that? Come on. Why should you read the Bible? Because Jesus says to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. Until I come, until I come, give your attention to public reading, exhortation, and teaching. Until I come, Scripture ought to be preeminent preeminent in our lives. The reason why we should read Scripture, so that you will be tightly knit to the Father. So that you will be tightly knit to the Father. John chapter 15 and verse 7 If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. Now, those of you who have understood or or understand exactly what that passage means, please meet me afterward and help me understand. It almost seems to suggest that I can ask anything if I'm in relationship with God and he's going to answer it. Very quickly, and this is for a, a totally another day and another different sermon, when we are in lockstep and we are in fellowship with the Lord, we know the Father's will, and even though we submit our will to him, there's a sense of peace in his will because you know that he is in control. Number three reason why we read it, because his words never pass away. There are no shelf lives, there's no expiration date on God's word. Listen to Matthew 24 and verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God remains forever. Fourth reason. So that you will have direction and wisdom in life. I don't even have to ask anybody to raise their hand on this one. 
We all need that. We all need wisdom. We all need direction. We all need God's guidance in our lives. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for the following, for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And then Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, this book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to recite it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. So if you want to be prosperous, if you want to succeed in everything that you do, what do you do? You recite day and night and observe everything written in God's word. So I hope in some way that I've presented to you the reason or the value of reading God's word. And now what I want to do is ask you to go after it. So again, what I want you to do is I want you to email me. If you're interested, I'll email back to you the Bible reading plan. If you decide not to do that, you want to do this on your own, you could probably Google search Discipleship Journal Bible reading plan and find exactly what, I've, what I have found there. But here's the, here's the thing. I'm going to be praying for you, and I'm going to look forward over the time that I have with you to hear how God has blessed and guided and directed you. And I'm telling you, there are days when you're going to read God's word and there's going to be a verse of scripture that's off of the pages of, of, uh, of your Bible and you're gonna say, God, thank you so much for that word for today. Hadn't planned on it because didn't know, but I got a text about an hour ago from a, a friend of mine whose father was the very first pastor that I served with. We served together at Oak Knoll Baptist Church in Haltom City, just outside of Fort Worth. His name, Ewell Humphreys. Went to bed last night and this morning at 96 woke up with Jesus. And the regret that I have was this, that over the next couple of months there's a possibility that I might be preaching for you and I stand before you today to say I really thought Ewell would be one of those fill-ins for me. And folks, I'm telling you, although he looks 96, man, there is a youthful exuberance about the Word of God. I'd love nothing more for him to call me up and say, Dave, I was reading this passage of Scripture. Let me tell you what God told me about this. At 96 years of age, couldn't get enough of God's love letter to him. And I suggest to you that if you will take me up on this challenge, it will be one of the high marks of this coming year. I'm not kidding. So I want you to turn with Psalm 119. Just in ca case you're ever asked in a, in a Bible trivia kind of thing, this is, the longest, this is the longest chapter in the Bible. And uh, with less than, you know, about 15 minutes less, I'm going to preach all 176 verses. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. 176 <laughs> verses. Longest chapter in the Bible. So your assignment for today, this afternoon, after lunch, after nap, is just to read through Psalm 119. Because the theme of this psalm is the Word of God. Now, most of us, when we think about the Psalms, we just attribute them all to David. King David, he wrote them all. We're not sure about that. We know that they were all inspired by God, and whether, whether David wrote them all, we're not sure. There's a possibility that David wrote this, and in just a minute, when I tell you about how the, how the chapter lays out, it might make some sense. People think that David used these 176 verses down into eight verse segments. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, so 22 times 8 is 176. You can test me out. I checked that a couple of times. And some people say that David used this passage of Scripture to teach Solomon the Hebrew alphabet. Some people say that there's a possibility that Daniel in the Old Testament wrote this. Some people say that maybe Ezra wrote this. It really doesn't matter so much as the fact that the, that the Lord of the universe inspired this, 
this passage of scripture, but in this passage of scripture, in this chapter, it's all about God's word. Every verse, every verse, let's say it one more time, every verse except for five refers to God's word. Verse number 84, verse number 90, verse number 121, verse number 122, and verse number 132. Those are the only five verses that don't reference the word of God in some form or fashion in all of these 176 verses. Here are some of the popular ones. Let me just kind of read through them. So if you have your Bible open to Psalm 119, let me read some that might, uh, that might stand out or might be recognizable to you. Verse number nine, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. How about verse 11? Thy word have I hid or I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Anybody heard that one before? You can raise your hand, that's fine, okay. How about verse number 18, a familiar one? Open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things from your law. Verse number 32 I shall run the way of thy commandments, for thou wilt enlarge my heart. That's probably enough. But all throughout this passage of Scripture, all throughout this chapter, Psalm 119, it's, the theme of this is the Word of God. Again, it's broken down into 22 sections, and so the first Hebrew letter is Aleph, A. The second Hebrew letter is B, Beth, and there are eight verses. And so if you want to break those down and if you want to read through those, you, uh, you're welcome to do that as you read through it. And some people say that maybe this was even put together this way because it would make it easier to memorize this psalm. Memorizing God's word. See, the writer had a great love for the word of God and we believe that he was persecuted because he obeyed God and he opposed sin. And most of the verses are either a prayer for God's help or an affirmation of the writer's faith in God and that God was going to help him through difficulties. In Psalm chapter 119, there are 10 different names for the word of God. And it would, been, would have been fun to be able this morning to be able to, to give you some kind of a Jeopardy question, get the music going in the background. Give me 10 alternate words for the word of God. Listen to the to words that are used. Word, law, saying, statutes, way, commandments, path, precepts, testimonies, and judgments. The writer of the book of Psalm 119 used all of those words to describe the word of God. And as you read through the book of Psalms, you're going to find that the author, whoever it was, whether it was David or Daniel or Ezra, this individual had a passion to know God's word, to read God's word, and to apply it to his life. Now, not only did he have 10 different names for the word of God, but the writer pictured the word of God in a variety of ways. And so, listen very carefully. I'll move through it quickly. He pictured the word of God as water, verse number nine. He pictured the word of God as treasure to be found and to be held onto, verses 14, 72, 127, 162. This is one of my favorite. He pictured the word of God as a companion and as a counselor. The word of God as companion and counselor. Let me read it for you in verse number 24. Thy testimonies also are my delight. They are my counselors. They are my companions. He pictures the word of God as a song in verse 54. He pictures the word of God as honey in verse 103. He pictures the word of God as light in verse 105 and 130. And then in verse 111, he pictures the word of God as being heritage. I, knew, I know that we're moving through this quickly. If you're interested in this, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to email you when you're asking for the Bible reading guide, uh, these notes as well. What the psalmist is saying 
is then we, when we truly delight in God's word, then we have a desire to meditate on it and to make it a part of our life. To meditate on it and to make it a part of our life. In fact, throughout this passage, throughout these 176 verses, he combines delight and meditation in verses 15 and 16, in verses 23 and 24, in verses 47 and 48, in verses 77 and 78. He connects delighting and meditating. I have to tell you, I delight on spending time with my wife. We enjoy walking together because it's some of the best time for us to be able to talk and to share with one another. It's just the two of us, and we're having an opportunity to have a conversation. The psalmist realized that reading God's word was a delight in his own life. Now, the psalmist had an amazing sense of, of the value of scripture in his own life. So check this out. In verse number 103, he says that the word of God is more valuable to him than the food that he eats. He says in verses, check this out, 52, 62, 147, and 148, that God's word is greater than sleep. He says in verses 14, 72, 127, and 162 that God's word has more value to him than money. So I put this together all on my own. So smile with me. When you're without sleep, if God's word's better, just get up and start reading God's word. And if you're anxious about money and God's word is more valuable than money, say, hey, this is what I'm going to focus my attention on. This is where I'm going to spend my time. See, we tend to think about what the Word of God will do for us if we allow it to work in our lives. So let me ask you this. Have you ever discovered what we must do with God's Word? I mean, think about that. Think about what what is God's Word going to do for me? And that tends to be the way in which we look at reading Scripture, at you know, hiding God's word in our heart. But I want to suggest to you that we need to do more than simply read it. Now, hear me carefully. Don't be tweeting out, Dave Smith says this. I think above and beyond just reading it. And this is going to be step one. Beyond reading it, here's what I think you and I should do. So if you're taking notes, this is what I want you to take down. Okay, and I'll go slow enough that you can do this. You and I should, number one, we should practice it. And all of this is in Psalm 119, verses 1 to 4, encourage us to practice God's word in our life. Make it practical, apply it to our life. Number one, we should practice it. Number two, we should memorize it. Verse number 11, thy word have I treasured in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Imagine all of the life, all the things that life brings our way and we have got a counterbalance of God's word giving us direction and guidance in what to do. So number one, we should practice it, verses one to four. Number two, we should memorize it, verse 11. Number three, we ought to meditate on it, verse number 15. Meditate. What does it mean to meditate? Well, here's what it means to me. I'll be reading through a passage of Scripture, and I'll, I'll read through you know, a portion of it. And I'll ask myself, is there anything there that I see that I need to make an adjustment in my own life? But the other thing is this. Stop long enough and say, Lord, what, what do you want me to learn from this? And that, for me, is that mode of meditation, stopping after I've read it and just kind of allowing it to kind of sink in. We practice it. We memorize it. We meditate on it. We learn it. We learn it. Verses number 26 and 27. Obviously, number five, we believe it. We believe it. Listen to what it says in verse number 42. So I shall have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in thy word. 
My belief, my trust, my confidence, my hope is in God's word. So I learn it, I believe it. As we've already talked about, we treasure it. Verse number 72, and then finally, we love it. I'm gonna go back over that list real quickly. We love it in verse number 97. Listen to what he says in verse number 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. So simply reading it is one dimension, it, dimensional, but what if we were to go above and beyond and practice it, memorize it, meditate on it, learn it, believe it, treasure it, and love it. Now, I realize I'm giving this to you with one whole month of grace. You could start on this 2021 resolution a whole month early, get done a whole month early, or if life gets crazy, I know you've never experienced crazy and out of sorts kind of life, then you've got a little extra grace which to deal with it. But here's what I want to tell you. I don't, I can't imagine anybody coming back. I really can't. And saying at the end of the year, man, Dave, what a bummer. Are you kidding me? You wanted me to read that whole thing? I am really disillusioned. Don't ever ask me to do that again. That's not going to happen. And how do I know that? Because in Isaiah 55, 10, and 11, which we started with, My word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty. But it will accomplish what I I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. I want to tell you this. I believe with all my heart that if you will do this in the next year, it will be one of those things that is a never-ending kind of thing. And I don't know when it was over the course of the year, I think it was about the time that we started mowing grass. I'm just telling you, this is real life kind of stuff. And I was not finding a lot of joy in grass. And I thought, you know what? Rather than just hear this endless weed eater and mower, I'm going to listen to scripture while I'm mowing. And literally one of the days I was in the minor prophets and I just mowed a little bit more. In fact, mowed my neighbor's yard. I really did because I was trying to get to the end of that that particular passage. And it was interesting because hearing God's word has a pretty profound effect on you. So that's my suggestion. That's my challenge to each and every one of us. And if you're listening online, you can still email me and I will email it back to you. My commitment to you is I will write down those names, all of your names, and I will hold on to it. But every now and then, just shoot me an email and say, hey, I came, I came across a verse, and I love it, and I, and I held on to it. Maybe you'll do like what my wife does sometimes, and she'll take uh, a highlighter or lipstick, and she'll write a verse on the bathroom mirror. A great way to, to begin the day. I'm going to close our time in prayer, and as I do... Um, Ask yourself, what would be the value in my own life of hiding God's word in my heart? Now, you might be here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. That's the first and foremost decision that you need to make. But once you give your life to Jesus, my encouragement is that that you would start reading his love letter to you. The love letter that he wrote to you telling of the story of his redeeming us and his saving us. So if you have not come to the point in your life of giving your life to Jesus, our staff will be here and we invite you to come and give your your life to Jesus. Maybe you've given your life to Jesus and you say, you know what, I've never followed the Lord in baptism and I want to do that. By the way, you'll want to be with us next Sunday. We have all kinds of baptisms scheduled and uh, we're looking forward to uh, to baptizing more folks. But maybe maybe this morning you, uh, you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you've been baptized, and you say, I just need a church fellowship to connect with. I invite you to come and to be a part of this church fellowship. So I'm going to close in prayer, and as I pray, I'm going to invite you to stand with me. Uh, our staff will be here at the front. They will socially 
they'll be socially distanced. If you'd like to come down, please make sure that you have your mask on. But maybe you just need someone to pray with you. Listen, that six feet is not too far for somebody to pray with you. And we'll be, we'll be along the front in any way that we can to be of support for you. Will you pray with me? So, Father, I thank you this morning for the privilege of opening your word. I thank you for the powerful, extraordinary ways in which you went to accomplish, God, your, uh, your will and your purpose in us having these, uh, these, these books of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, great wisdom, great insight, great uh, instruction for life. Father, as we come to the conclusion of this service, I pray that you might, through your spirit, challenge us as where, how, to, how we should respond. God, if there's someone here that has not given their life to you, God, I pray that today that would be a decision that they would, they would step into. Or to follow you in baptism or to join this church. But, but God, if there's someone here that just needs a prayer, Father, we invite them to, to come and to kneel along this altar and, and either by themselves or under the direction or the uh, accompaniment of a staff member to pray. So God, you lead us in this invitation time. It's in your name I pray. Amen.